Today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Kerry Cashel. You might want to watch this one on YouTube with subtitles because we're both sounding very Irish. Kerry is a GP with a special interest in women's hormones, right from the teenage years to the postmenopausal period. Kerry is passionate about raising awareness of just how much hormones impact overall health especially during the transition to the menopause and beyond. In this episode, we discuss the roles of estrogen, progesterone and testosterone within the body, how changing hormone levels affect your brain and why testosterone is as important for women as it is for men. There is so much to learn in this episode for everyone, but especially anyone who's been thinking about hormone replacement therapy. Let's get into it. Kerry, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this evening. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an interesting reacquaintancing that we've been having. That's maybe not even the right word. But um, we worked together, I think, about 22 or 23 years ago in Northern Ireland, briefly. And interestingly, we were brought back together by the menopause, which has been interesting. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about how we reconnected? Yes, so last year I organised an event with Dr Louise Newson, who was coming to Australia uh, to present at the first uh, conference on, on women's mental health in Melbourne and a friend suggested that I should just email her and ask if she would come and speak in the Northern Beaches of Sydney. So I took that advice and sent her an email and she very kindly agreed to detour and it was through that that this person, Dr. Shauna Watts, sent an email saying, I need to come get me a ticket. I'm coming down. And then I realized that's Shauna Watts, who um, is married to Peter, whose mum my mum paints with back in Northern Ireland. Because Northern Ireland, as anybody who comes from uh, Northern Ireland knows, is a village and we all have about one degree of separation. But yes, it was through menopause and since then really we've had lots of conversations and lots of debates and shared information about the complexities of menopause, about how poor menopause care still is for the majority of women and how much we still really need to get better education out there for women themselves so that they can understand this phase of their lives so much better than they currently do. Yeah, absolutely. A definitely a shared passion. So let's get into it. I thought we would start. Let's go to basics. So let's talk about what is menopause? What is this very popular word at the minute, perimenopause? And when is the postmenopause and everything in between? So are you happy to give us some definitions? Yeah. So menopause is actually just one day in a woman's life. And and a natural menopause that is 12 days after her last menstrual period. Yes, 12 months after the last day. So it's just one day. So that's the day of menopause. And after that day, really, you're postmenopausal. But most people and most doctors would still talk about that as menopause. And really, then, perimenopause is the time up until that point. And that can be as short as a few months, or it can be as long as 10 or 12 years. And I think one of the best descriptions of that is it is really the time when your ovaries are stuttering. So they're not producing high quality eggs every month that allow for the normal, lovely cyclical rise and fall of estrogen and progesterone that you would experience earlier in life. And it's probably perimenopause is more akin to the years of adolescence or puberty when ovaries are getting started. So... Perimenopause is like the other bookend of a woman's reproductive years. So you've got adolescence at the start, and that can be short or long for some women. And in the same respect, perimenopause can be short or long at the other end. And I think it's probably reasonably well established that for a lot of women, it can be the perimenopause years that can be the most difficult. And that's because the hormones really can go up and down quite widely. Um, because as we both know, hormones have multiple effects in the body. It can cause a whole array of symptoms that women can be hugely unprepared for. And often in a way, like being a teenager again, 
But unlike being a teenager, when you really only have to go to school and go into your room, when you're an adult woman in perimenopause, you're usually managing a job. You often have to manage a partner. You've often got to manage children who are often teenagers themselves. You might be caring for elderly parents. So you don't have the luxury of saying, you know, I need some space. That's not usually how a teenager says it, but I need some space and I would like some time in my room just to decompress. A perimenopausal woman doesn't have that space or that time. So that makes it a real challenge. Yeah, it might feel like slamming a door too. (laughs) And so during this chaotic time of the perimenopause, we've got hormone levels that are kind of varying wildly, but really the other trend is that they're on the downward slope so that the actual overall levels are decreasing year on year. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So they're sort of, we're learning more and more about this transition time and there's some evidence coming through suggesting in early perimenopause that perhaps it's progesterone that might be the dominant deficiency in that time and that it then becomes later, it becomes more of a combination of the dropping levels of estrogen and progesterone. And then our third hormone that's really important in women, which was a revelation really for me two and a half years ago when I began this hormone journey, um, was that testosterone is a a very important uh, female sex hormone. So both men and women have testosterone, estrogens and progesterone. And so the testosterone for some women can actually plummet way before estrogen and progesterone and we're not quite sure why that happens it's possible it's a you know a condition like an autoimmune condition because we see it more commonly in women who have thyroid problems but testosterone can be declining slowly in the background while estrogen and progesterone are fluctuating and overall declining so a woman might be suffering all three of those hormones really going out of whack at once and as I said, often can develop a thyroid problem in this time as well. So it can be a lot of hormonal flux. And I think the thing is a lot of women probably listening or or anyone listening might be surprised to know that testosterone in women in their 20s and 30s is often one of their most biologically active hormones. But lots of people out there don't even know that women have testosterone in any kind of a, a dose really, and we really do. And so let's just step back before we talk a little bit more about what the different hormones do, but just to sort of confirm what actually is a hormone? Yeah, so people get really concerned about this idea of hormones and taking hormones, but all hormones are are chemical messengers that deliver information from one part of the body to another. And then wherever they arrive, they tell that organ or at a basic level, that cell, what to do and when to do it. So the analogy I like to use is thinking of a big corporation and you've got your CFO and your CEO sitting at the top up in the brain and it's sending out hormones to middle management and then to junior management and then out to the workers at the cool face. And it gets those jobs done. So those messages traveling around the body or around a corporation are essential for whether it's the human body or a giant corporate to run really efficiently and really effectively. And when when those messages get disrupted or when the messages aren't traveling, then the workers at the cool face don't know what to do. So it's the same for our body. And they'll sometimes they'll potter along and they'll make an okay job of it. But oftentimes things get disorganized and we can see cells starting to do things that they shouldn't do and that can put people at risk of things like cancer or it can mean that the cells just aren't producing enough energy and and for women in menopause transition that really does translate to just being tired. So a hormone is an essential part of the human body. Without our hormones we wouldn't function. So they're, they're a really important thing. They're not a dangerous thing. They are just part of how a biological organism works. And isn't it interesting as doctors that we're very comfortable that if someone has low levels of thyroid hormone, for example, we would never say, we'll just see how you go without that thyroxin. You know, we're we're very quick to jump on and regulate that hormone. And yet it seems like there's been years and years of fear in the medical community about regulating these other hormones. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think that's, it's really when you break it down to the basic science, it seems bizarre that we're so scared of these three fabulous hormones that do a lot more than determine our sex. I think a lot of it goes back to the big study that we're both aware of, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners have heard of, which was 
the WHI study, which came out in 2002 or was stopped early in 2002 because of concerns. So in the 80s and 90s, it was actually quite acceptable and probably very much a standard part of medical practice that women in menopause transition, so going through perimenopause into postmenopause, did often feel better and seemed to have better health on hormone replacement therapy. And this study was designed in the early 1990s to see if the same benefits could be applied to older women. So this WHI study that has devastated women's health for the past 20 years was really designed to see if women over the age of 60 would do well on HRT if they started it late. And that's really what it was designed to do. And the study used an o- older forms of hormone therapy compared to what we use today. They used conjugated equine oestrogen, which is the horse's urine oestrogen that everybody knows of, which has some benefits. It's not a terrible thing, but it is different. And they used synthetic progestins, which means they're not, they're going to have off-target effects. And that study, unfortunately, did show an increased risk of stroke and an increased risk of breast cancer. And that then was published in one of the biggest medical journals in the world and was instantly taken up by the the big media outlets. And as everybody knows, it's bad news that sells and bad news sticks. And we, as human beings, whether we're doctors or women or or anybody else, the fear of something bad happening happening tends to dominate our our thinking. So it's hard to rationalise out uh, a, an emotional fear. So we've had generation of doctors who have really been educated to think that hormone therapy and the form, when we're using um, hormone therapy to treat menopause is a really risky treatment. When in fact, all of the data when we look at it now shows that when we use body identical hormones, so that's using hormones that are chemically identical to our own or ovarian hormones, there is no increased risk of breast cancer. And in terms of stroke risk, when we use oestrogen through the skin in in a form of a patch or a gel, which is what we have here in Australia, there's no increased risk of stroke or an increased risk of heart attack. And indeed, there actually is a reduced risk of heart disease, amongst other things. So unfortunately for doctors like ourselves who have come through and graduated in the late 90s, we've grown up in, a, in an environment where hormone therapy has really been considered a risky, dangerous treatment. And, and I expect that's partly why it was such a knowledge gap for people like us, you know, and it still is a huge knowledge gap. It's not there for doctors in training. It's not there for medical students. It's not included at any great depth for any doctor in any specialty, which is crazy because every single doctor sees women, you know, whether they're a urologist or whether they're a cardiologist or whether they're a GP. So we've got this huge gap and it is largely based after that study. So one study did decimate, you know, the treatment of hormones in women. Yeah, and with great and grave consequences, it would seem. I mean, I think both of us have... No, I've seen a plethora of women when we've had this knowledge and we've treated them differently. But I think both of us would also say we can look back and say that we'd nearly like to reverse back time a few years and go back and treat a few patients that we saw a few years back and maybe treat them differently than we did. Because maybe some of the people that we put on, for example, antidepressants would have been much better served by having hormones or maybe having hormones alongside their antidepressants. Is that sort of a feeling that you have as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. So when I sort of started this journey of knowledge into hormone therapy, you know, well, that was one of the most sort of profound effects was thinking of the woman that I'd prescribed, in retrospect, the wrong treatment to. And um, and I was lucky because with the job I'm in at the minute, you know, I have this sort of lovely continuity of care, so I still look after a lot of the same patients. So those people I was able to change, you know, their treatment pathways and with profound effects and their well being. But looking back, especially looking back at work I've done in more deprived practices and working with people where English wasn't necessarily their first language, I I really always think of women who were from South Asia often coming to see me with a son as a translator, which must have been so difficult for them. 
and talking about all over body pain. And I just remember thinking, I have no idea what this all over body pain is. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. And sending them away with, you know, a type of antidepressant that we would use for chronic, chronic pain. And really, that's just the most succinct description, really, of perimenopause is that everything hurts. You know, your brain hurts, your your feet hurt, your vagina hurts, you know, everything is sore. And, you know, yes, that's definitely a group I would love to go back and yeah, and, and offer something different to in the form of hormone therapy. It's, it's, yeah, that's a big regret. Whenever you look into the symptoms that are listed for this period of life, it somewhere it lists 47 symptoms and somewhere 57. But what we know is that there are a lot of symptoms. And I don't know about you, but basically sometimes I get frustrated whenever people automatically jump to hot flushes as being, oh, um, menopause, that's whenever your periods stop. You can no longer have a baby and you get hot flushes. And to be honest, yes, of course, I do see people with hot flushes that are troublesome but it's definitely not the main group of symptoms I see. Um, In fact, I would say it's maybe number seven or number eight in the list. Is that, do you have a similar sort of experience that you're getting people presenting? Like, I have to say, like not being able to sleep, but not necessarily because of hot flushes, just not actually being able to sleep, feeling anxious or having panic attacks like you've never had before. And, you know, just having this horrendous fatigue all the time like I would say those are the commonest symptoms that I would come across or not being able to remember things just feeling like you haven't got that mental clarity that you used to have and so definitely hot flushes definitely get mentioned and people are relieved when you take them away but uh, certainly I feel like the menopause has sort of been sort of diminished somehow to be this collection of you know a couple of things and you know oh well you just get through it and move on and it's really not the case what are the commonest symptoms that you see? Yeah, I think that's you've covered so many great points there and it certainly reflects back to our medical education. So all doctors know that hot flushes and night sweats are caused by menopause, but therein often that's the beginning and the end of the awareness of the symptoms. And it comes back to basic science. And once you understand that you've got these hormone receptors that are receiving these messages from your brain or your other organs, on every single cell in your body, it's clear that any symptom can be attributed to a hormonal problem, whether that's, you know, premenstrual phase in your reproductive life or whether that's in perimenopause. I mean, any symptom can be menopause. It certainly does not mean that all symptoms are secondary to menopause. And I think as GPs, we're very good and very well placed to sort of look and try and differentiate and we can do a trial of treatment while still investigating other symptoms. But you're quite right, it's those neurological or neurocognitive symptoms where it's the receptors in the brain and the fluctuating levels of hormone in the brain itself that can really be most debilitating to women. And that is exactly, as you've said, it's symptoms like insomnia where there aren't any hot flushes, there's just insomnia. And I think that's often a very early symptom and something I've experienced. And if you are a bit of an anxious person, that insomnia will mean that you wake up at 3 a.m. and you worry about the apocalypse. If you're not an anxious person, it might just mean you wake at 3 a.m. and think about everything else and you've got two hours of wonderful thinking, but equally you would really like to be asleep because you've got to get up at 7 a.m. and get the kids ready and get out to work. So insomnia is a big one. And I think when you fix insomnia you know, it allows somebody to do so much more in their day in terms of looking after their general health. But also we know sleep is so important for our health, you know, and that's probably one of the places you get the biggest return is when you fix the sleep disturbance of perimenopause or menopause. And the other symptoms that are can be, you know, really awful for women are definitely the anxiety and the panic attacks that they have no idea where they've come from. You know, that all can happen to women who have no history of mental health issues. It also obviously can happen to women with a history of mental health problems, and it often makes those mental health problems worse. And um, the the problems with your your sort of your brain function, as you say, you know that if you're working in a high level corporate job, and I see women who have really been at the top of their career, you know, they're CEOs, you know, they're presenting on boards. And suddenly they can't find the key word in their sentence that's, you know, 
sells their message or sells their product or is going to sway their board. And that's really, really disabling. And I have encountered so many women who have reduced their hours or left their job, possibly because they are financially able to. But you think, gosh, these are people we want to stay in the workplace. We want them at the top of these businesses. We want them in politics, you know, because the, that way you can really change, you know, the whole fabric of society by having, you know, those strong leaders. But even if you're, you know, you've got a, an ordinary job, you know, you're still, most women are really the hubs of so much, you know, whether it's of their family or of their job or of their community. So to have those women feel diminished or lose their self-esteem, you know, that can really have such a ripple effect to so many more people and themselves. So supporting those women and those symptoms can be phenomenal how that affects them. So that's kind of your your brain symptoms. And another one that people really struggle with is a loss of joy. So you can't experience pleasure and that can often be misdiagnosed as depression. And unfortunately, an antidepressant often makes that loss of joy even worse. So you maybe don't get so saddened by the loss of joy but equally you don't get your happiness back and that's something I see when women then come off their antidepressants if they're able to is that they can experience happiness again and that's that's really beautiful and but then working our way down through the body you know it really can be anything I there's some great studies going back to the 1980s looking at the effect of the three hormones in your eyes you know causing dry eyes and causing sticky eyes and we see women getting changes in their breathing because of changes in their airway tone or their muscles in between their ribs. We see women getting palpitations. That's another really early one. So a feeling of your heart racing or fluttering, often waking them up in the middle of the night. And I don't know how many women I've sent over the years, you know, for multiple heart investigations. And it's all probably been hormonal. And um, women getting the joint pain is really very disabling as well and often stops them more um, exercising which then compounds their menopause and um, often starts in the feet interestingly and I think that's because there's so many small joints in the feet so you often get people you know just saying they can't really walk or go to the gym or run because their feet are so sore um, and then there's you know your gut symptoms we all any woman that has had periods knows that their gut tends to be a bit different throughout their menstrual menstrual cycle and the same, it's the same, it's the same thing in perimenopause. So whether that's getting worsening of acid reflux or constipation or diarrhea, um, and then all the skin changes. I love the random skin stuff, like an itchy back, which I've had for a few years, and never would have occurred to me that was a hormonal thing, but it's completely disappeared on HRT or itchy ears. I think that's a really good random one, and seems to be quite a popular one on Instagram. Um, and then, you know, just things that people, again, would probably be a wee bit more aware of would be sort of changes in your pelvic floor and loss of sort of vaginal lubrication, which can lead to discomfort during sex, but also really importantly can increase your risk of having urinary tract infections. And there's all of these women who have recurrent urinary tract infections to whom nobody's even offered some estrogen cream for their vagina, which isn't even HRT uh, and is safe for everybody to take. So... It's such a wonderful array of symptoms that can be treated with one treatment in the form of hormone therapy. It's, you know, it's such a missed opportunity, you know, when you see these array of symptoms, you know, that you could, there's not really any other drug that treats multiple things at once, which is phenomenal, you know. So, I know we were talking earlier and I think it would be really lovely now if we could just talk through a, a few hypothetical cases. Um, I saw a patient on Friday and she had been told she had a very early menopause like I have and but she was told she was too young for hormone replacement therapy so it would be lovely just for us to explore when is too young to have hormone replacement therapy yeah that's such a great question and it is something I've encountered quite a few times so in terms of the too young uh, I had on my list before I became sort of hormone obsessed I had three teenage patients who have what's called premature ovarian insufficiency and that's for women who stop having periods before the age of 40. So this, I think, is a group of women who are hugely underdiagnosed and to be in menopause in your teens is is really quite dramatic and I think a lot of those younger women and girls do get missed and are just told they've got irregular periods and maybe just go on the contraceptive pill and that will sort things out, which they may stay on for another 5, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. 
Um, so there's, there is nobody who is really too young for HRT. I think that's something that's so important to take away. But that's, those are obviously more unusual cases. What's really important is that we know that the, although the average age of menopause, that one day, is 51, the range is typically 45 to 55. So if we take the slightly earlier part of that typical range of 45 being your last period, if you subtract 10 years from that, that is 35. So we have a huge number of women who are aged 35 to 40 who are in early perimenopause, or perimenopause, it's not particularly early, and nobody in their 30s is really thinking about their hormones being the cause of their insomnia. And a lot of those women have gone straight from having children and, you know, maybe being pregnant and breastfeeding and having a disruptive toddler to going into this perimenopause and they just assume that their symptoms are down to the chaos of life or the chaos of a new baby and nobody's thinking about their hormones. So I think the answer to that question is you are never too young, but it's really difficult because if you're in perimenopause, as we both know, there is no blood test that will diagnose your perimenopause, irrespective of your age. And we have some confusing guidelines that say if you're trying to diagnose a woman under the age of 45, some say under 40, you must do a blood test. And while the blood test is really important to exclude menopause, that is the end of periods, it does not exclude an earlier perimenopause. And that's so key. So we have all of these women getting more and more educated with all of the information that's available, going along to doctors saying, I think I'm in perimenopause. And the doctor saying, let's check your bloods no, your bloods are fine, you're not. And that is incorrect. So we've got a huge population there. So frustrating. And isn't it interesting how, as doctors and as uh, as anyone out there, we all accept that fertility becomes much more difficult in the, in the late 30s, and yet somehow we don't connect that, okay, so it might be much harder to get pregnant in your late 30s and 40s, but somehow you're too young to have a hormone problem? It's it's just, you know, once you start to see it, you know, everything does make much more sense, but it's almost like you couldn't see the wood for the trees or the missing jigsaw pieces. But absolutely, we I mean, ovarian function by the age of 30, I think it's down to something, and I, I'm going to guess, but I think it's 5 to 10% of what it was. It's Your ovarian function is so much lower and your egg reserve is so much lower, you know, than it was, you know, in your 20s. Um, and, you know, the, the egg quality is diminishing as we go through life because we're born with the precursors of our eggs, you know, so they've been around and they, they unfortunately do you know, sort of have a bit of a shelf life. And that does mean that the quality of our our eggs producing our hormones is not as good by the time we hit our late 30s and certainly not by the time we're in our 40s. And we have this real disconnect between understanding exactly that, that, you know, fertility diminishes, but maybe it's because hormones are diminishing. But equally, we have no problem giving women of all ages the contraceptive pill. And while the pill is a fantastic form of contraception, it does have side effects and it's never completely identical to our own hormones. There are some that are slightly identical, but not completely. And we have no issue with giving teenagers the contraceptive pill but we have a huge issue with giving women in their 30s or their 40s or 50s or whatever natural hormones back at a low level so again a huge paradox there that makes no sense once you understand the science and so just to 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 make that clear so if our let's say we have our average um person who's 38 and she comes along and she's worried that she's got perimenopausal symptoms Is her taking the contraceptive pill a solution? So I think some women do find that the contraceptive pill can help their symptoms. So there definitely is a group of women who find that that helps. But I am always concerned that you're not replacing what is missing. You're giving something different. And while a contraceptive pill in that case can sometimes help the symptoms and also provide contraception, you're not giving that woman exactly what she needs. And also the contraceptive pill will block a woman's natural testosterone production. So, and we know that testosterone is another really key hormone, both for symptom control, but also for future health. So the contraceptive pill would not be my first choice for a woman in perimenopause. 
But if she wanted to do that, if she felt that was more in keeping with her, her health beliefs, then that is fine. But it would not be my first choice for the reason that you're not replacing what's missing with what is missing. So would you put this person on hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a pretty wide breadth of who I will offer hormone therapy to very much on the basis that all of my colleagues don't have any problems offering the contraceptive pill to people of all ages up until the age of 50 of course for the contraceptive pill so I have patients who are in their early 20s who take hormone replacement therapy to manage their premenstrual mood disorder which is another indication that we've not covered And I have somebody there as well for the premature ovarian insufficiency. But I have quite a lot of patients in their late 30s who are trying hormone therapy for their perimenopause. But it isn't contraception. So when you use body identical hormone therapy, unfortunately, nobody's created a body identical contraceptive slash HRT product. Yeah, that's. But apparently it is on the agenda, might be here in five years. So... It, I still, you know, for a couple that's been together for a while and they've finished their family, I would still say a vasectomy is number one choice for contraception if you've finished your family. If you haven't, then the other options that can be really good can be something like uh, an intrauterine device or a coil and you can get hormonal ones or you can get a copper one if you're trying to avoid any synthetic hormones. And also you can take some of the progestin only pills which are synthetic alongside HRT to provide contraception. So there's quite a few options there for women and also important to include men in that contraceptive discussion. Don't know about you, but my uh, most of my patients seem to really struggle to get their husbands to have vasectomies. Seems to be. Had all sorts of patients withdraw sex for 12 months as a protest and the, the partner still didn't back down and have the vasectomy so well, I think, uh, maybe I've got a I've got a more persuasive group of females I haven't heard that being too much of an issue so far but you're right a lot of them a lot of the women still do carry the contraceptive burden and will be looking at using an IUD so yes I'm, I think that's definitely true okay so let's swing to the other end of the spectrum um last night I um gave a, a speech at an, uh, at an amazing event and I was sitting at a table with a number of women who were in their 60s and 70s probably and they all wanted to come and talk to me afterwards because I had talked a little bit about the health consequences of being in the postmenopausal period of your life and that you have an increased risk of heart disease and an increased risk of dementia and you've got an increased risk of having osteoporosis and all fractures etc. And they all wanted to know, was it too late? So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. So I think that's a brilliant question. And it really speaks to this other thing that menopause is, which is a period of time where a woman's health can really deteriorate quite acutely, whether that is seen or unseen. So not all women will have symptoms in perimenopause and menopause, but I expect all women will have a change at a cellular level. And the, the diseases that really increase as a result of menopause are dementia, osteoporosis, and cardiovascular disease. And for women in that transition period, there's a really golden opportunity to start to reduce those future disease risks. But also, even if you move out of that golden window, window of opportunity, which is sort of considered to be around about 10 years after the last menstrual period, there are studies using transdermal estrogen, which is the gel or the patch in women up to the age of 79, without any adverse cardiovascular effects, so without risk, and still seeing improvements in bone density. So as you well know yourself, with a range of patients of all ages, some women will continue to have symptoms for their whole life. And I think we probably haven't really got accurate data on that. I have quite a lot of women who have continued to flush until their 70s or 80s or even into their 90s. And we know that, for instance, hot flushes are not a benign phenomenon. And that means that they're not just a symptom, but they reflect changes in somebody's body, in particular in somebody's brain and possibly in their heart with hot flushes. 
So especially, I think, for women who continue to have those marked symptoms of hot flushes and night sweats, I think there is, we should really be considering uh, really in an individual basis, the risk and benefit of starting hormone therapy at ages that maybe are even beyond the 10 year window. And we don't have such great data about starting estrogen later, but we do have some. And it does suggest that there is a safety, a reasonable safety level there when you're using estrogen through the skin. So I personally don't think any woman is too old. And I am very happy to have that individualized discussion with somebody. And women are intelligent creatures, of course they are. And they can often, if you provide them with that information and they can weigh up you know, the benefits of maybe being able to sleep better, to be able to move more comfortably so that they can go to the gym, so that they have the energy to go and see their grandchildren, you know, just to really live their life in a more full way. I think that is a decision that a woman should be allowed to make rather than me say, no, you're 61 or no, you're 65. And interestingly, the latest guidelines from the Australian Menopause Society has included women up to the age of 65 to be considered for hormone therapy to treat a loss of bone density. So that's a bit of a departure from the very strict up to the age of 60 or within 10 years. And there has been a, you know, and certainly the other part of that is whether women should stop their hormone therapy after five years or at the age of 60. And I think there's good evidence now to show that there really is no need for women to stop their hormone therapy if they do not want to stop it. And and because of those future health benefits, I do think that there's a lot to be gained for, for women staying on their hormone therapy, whether that's improving their heart health, their bone health, their brain health or their skin health. There's good evidence to show that they enjoy a longer and healthier life as a result of their hormone therapy. Yeah, I definitely find a lot of my patients... They like the sense of wellness that they have on their hormones and they're reluctant to give it up. Kerry, I want to talk to you a little bit more about the brain and the impacts of these hormones on the brain and what estrogen, for example, is doing in the brain and what testosterone is doing in the brain. Because I think people are, you know, probably quite surprised to know that these things are so active and and influencing really how the brain is functioning and we've obviously talked already about the various symptoms that people can have but what is research telling us like I always think now of estrogen as being the conductor of the orchestra of a female brain and you know without the conductor you can definitely still have the rest of the orchestra playing their tune but it might not be quite the tune that you wanted to have and trombones might be trying to outdo the violins when they're not meant to be. Um, is this really new stuff that is coming to the forefront of our understanding? Because I certainly don't really remember being taught any of this stuff at medical school, that estrogen was was doing all this stuff in the brain. I think there certainly hasn't been a lot of research. It's definitely changing. And obviously Lisa Moscone's book, The Menopause Brain, has just been released this year. But we do have studies, so there is evidence that both, especially the, the type of estrogen estradiol that's made by the ovaries, but is also made in the brain itself. So even after menopause, we think that the brain continues to produce a little bit of estradiol and a bit of progesterone and possibly some testosterone. But in the brain, those hormones are really potent at acting to help our neurotransmitters be released and controlled. So they affect our levels of serotonin, of dopamine and of GABA. So estradiol is really involved in our feeling of happiness, our feeling of joy, our motivation. And also progesterone is very involved in producing GABA, which allows us to sleep, which allows us to feel less anxious. So they, and they work, it seems that they work quite synergistically together. So they enhance each other's effects. So one with the other helping in the release of those neurotransmitters and regulating our behavior. In psychiatry and psychology, there's been a real tendency to separate sort of our behavior and our emotions as if it's happening somewhere else, like in the cloud. But it's not happening in the cloud, it's happening in our brain. And certainly people like Esther Kulkarni have spoken a lot to this, 
that these hormones are so metabolically active in our brain tissue, which drives our emotions, our feelings and our behaviours. To ignore their potency there is such a missed opportunity. And, you know, I, that's really where you do see the most phenomenal benefits of hormone therapy is when you give those hormones back and people start to sleep and their anxiety reduces and their joy comes back. I think that's really, really beautiful. Testosterone is less well studied in the female brain because of this misconception that testosterone is a male hormone. So we've got more data looking at estradiol and progesterone and they certainly are very potent. They do a really cool thing apart from the neurotransmitters and they will stimulate more nerve cells to grow, but they also um, help the coating of the nerves, the myelin sheath, which is like the insulation of the wires going around your house. So they're the only thing that can make that regenerate, which is just amazing. And that's why, you know, there's trials at the minute using a type of estrogen in patients with multiple sclerosis. And so I, if these drugs maybe had a bit more of market value, I do think we'd be looking at them a lot more because they have powerful effects in all parts of the body. But these are quite old drugs. They're off patent. So not necessarily going to make somebody a huge amount of money, um, but they really could do phenomenal things for so many aspects of medical treatment. And I suspect possibly also in men, if we looked at it a bit more there too. We used to think that women were overrepresented in the group um, who have dementia because women lived longer. But really, when you look at the numbers, that just doesn't actually add up at all. Do we know why? Um, women seem to have more dementia. Yeah, we, we do think it's about the menopause transition, so that falling level of estradiol. So men, as they age, and for anybody that doesn't know, a healthy man should be able to reproduce until he dies, whereas women's fertility ends at menopause. So a lot of women will spend about a third of their life without the hormones estrogen and progesterone. So without those potent steroids in the brain, we lose myelin and we lose our neurotransmitters. And the other thing that the loss of those hormones drives is inflammation at a cellular level. So our little mitochondria, which are powerhouses of our cells, are covered in estrogen receptors. So when that estrogen disappears, those little mitochondria start to die off and that will impact the metabolism in our muscles or in our heart, but also in our brain. So without those hormones, unfortunately, women's brains do change. And I was quite shocked when I realised, having looked at it so many times without seeing it, when we do an MRI scan of a woman who is postmenopausal, it's actually pretty standard for it to say white matter changes, normal for age. But it doesn't say that on male MRI brains. So there is this acceptance that women's brains are different at that age compared to men. And when you sort of dive into that detail, it's because of hot flushes and night sweats causing little bits of damage to the brain in that menopause transition that we get those changes. Now, that doesn't mean that all women with those changes get dementia, but it's certainly that drop in hormones, that resulting inflammation, that change in the little powerhouses, the mitochondria that is connected with dementia and obviously certain people are more prone to it because of certain genetic types um, and they are at increased risk. And there's some emerging evidence that we really should be trying to target women with those genotypes and considering them potentially as even that they would benefit even more from hormone therapy than other people for the prevention of dementia. I'd love to talk to you now a little bit more about testosterone in women and who and why you might consider putting a woman on testosterone? Yeah, so testosterone, as that was really, as I said, the beginning of my deep dive into hormones. So uh, I had a patient who came to see me and she said, I've been started on testosterone and it's just changed my life and I would like you to take over prescribing. And I said, well, I don't really know very much about testosterone. She goes, well, you need to because it's brilliant and go and do this course. So it took me a bit of time, but I did go and do that course which is the Confidence in Menopause course. And that really blew my mind. One, that testosterone is a female sex hormone. And exactly as you say, it's there in higher, higher amounts than estrogen in our 20s. And it's actually there in higher amounts 
or it should be when we are postmenopausal. So our testosterone is made by our adrenal glands and it's also made even by the ovary if you still have your ovaries after menopause. So I have some fabulous older ladies who've allowed me to check their testosterone levels just out of interest and one of them who's a very good age and very good age her testosterone was through the roof in a female range so it was sitting at 20 times what mine was and she can squat down and move around she's not on any medication so there is evidence historically that women's testosterone used to go up again in their 70s so low it fell through the 30s and 40s and 50s historically there was a a, a sort of a, a peak and I wonder if that's the women that got through that long they got they were going to be in charge of the tribe they were going to be the new leaders because women make better leaders in my opinion because they're more outward facing and worry about the community more than themselves so testosterone is this actually quite high female hormone and it probably buffers us to an extent through menopause when our other hormones fall as long as it hasn't fallen as well so testosterone we're lucky in Australia because we're the only country in the world to have a licensed product um, for women called Androfem, but it's only licensed for hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is a bit of a mouthful. And quite, no, it's definitely not just low sex drive. You have to meet multiple criteria, like your low sex drive can't be caused by medications, by relationship problems, by other medical illnesses. Um, you have to have done a full psychological assessment, etc., etc., etc. I'm not aware of any of those prerequisites to prescribe a man Viagra and testosterone is much safer than Viagra. So that's what testosterone is licensed for. My clinical experience is that testosterone can be a game changer when it works and it doesn't always make a difference. But when it works, it often gives women back their libido for life. So a zest for their work or their family or their their social activities or their sports or whatever it is that they were into that they'd lost that excitement for. So it's a real libido for life drug. Um, and the other things that I do think it makes a difference to would be joint pain. And there is evidence for improving bone density in women and being able to build muscle. And if a woman can start to build muscle again, then that in itself has such future health benefits we know that our muscle is a huge one of the biggest organs if not the biggest organ in our body and when we have more muscle we move better so we can do things and we probably live longer and our brain is a muscle so it has got testosterone receptors in it so although it's licensed for in short terms low libido it doesn't always work for low libido because libido is very complicated and testosterone is not going to fix a bad relationship but I think it's quite exciting and how it gives women energy. It can reduce their joint pain and it can just give them zest back for life. So it is, it's a very safe drug. It rarely causes side effects. It needs monitored so that you stay in the female range, but really in general, it's well tolerated. But for some women, it makes no difference at all. And I don't know why that is. Yeah, absolutely. That's my experience as well. Some people are really excited about going on it and we kind of get six months in and there's not much of a difference. And then other people, I have to say, the other thing I find is people will say they've got mental clarity that they didn't have before or that they had previously lost. They just feel a bit sharper, that they can remember things. Um, and a lot of women will be a little bit worried that if you give them testosterone that they're going to get really hairy and grow a beard and get a deep voice and things. But I'm always very reassuring about that. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. There is a possibility if you keep putting the testosterone onto the same spot on your leg that you'll grow a little bit of hair there depending on your hair your hair and skin type. But no, it definitely doesn't grow, make you grow a beard. You'd have to go to quite high levels to the levels that, for instance, a trans man, you know, a female transitioning to male would have to take. That's when you would see hair changes on your face. Um, some people worry that it might cause hair loss. And it, there's a possibility, and maybe it does do that occasionally, but there's ways to combat that as well. And sometimes that needs a bit of tweaking, but it doesn't cause any of the severe side effects that you read about on the sheet. And I think it's really empowering to show women, you know, when you get your, your laboratory results back and you see their estrogen levels and their testosterone levels. And if you put them into the same units, which as we know, they're in different units with the, from our labs, that makes testosterone look not very important for women. Put them in the same units. You go, 
there's your estrogen as a postmenopausal woman. It's less than 80. And there's your testosterone. It's, it's 100 or it's, you know, it's 1800, you know. So it's quite interesting, you know, testosterone range for a postmenopausal woman is 100 to 1800 when you put it in the same units as their estrogen, which is actually undetectable. So they're sitting there with more testosterone than estrogen. Their husband is probably sitting there with more estrogen than they are. So it's really a lot different to what we've been taught. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's definitely time for uh, doctors, allied health professionals, everyone to really transition the way that we're looking at this and how we've looked at it for a very long time. But I think we've got a bit of an uphill battle on our hands. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there's we're still trying to deal with a lot of that fear about hormones from the WHI study and there's a lot of rhetoric in both from health professionals but other other interested parties about looking at non-hormonal treatments and that is a nonsense in itself because everything as we talked at the beginning in our body is mediated by hormonal hormonal messages so there is no such thing as a non-hormonal treatment it may not be a hormone but it will exert its effects in your body at your cellular level by changing your hormones so there is this real misuse of terminology both by health professionals and as I say interested parties and I do think part of the battle that we have is that this gold standard body identical hormone therapy is only made by these small companies and when women take hormone therapy I think they don't need as many other drugs so they're possibly not going to need their antidepressant or their drug for osteoporosis or their drug for high blood pressure, or their diabetes drugs. And you just wonder, is that affecting somebody else's, you know, profit sheet? And is that part of why we're fighting this battle? Yeah, I have to say, I uh, I, I definitely think there's something there. Um, I know both of us are both very, very passionate about the lifestyle and um, things that people can do to also help. And that's not to replace the hormones, which I think we're both in very strong agreement where we're very pro hormones, but as someone who's really spent a lot of time looking into lifestyle medicine, and I know that you're very interested in all of that, what other things do you get your patients to do? Like, for example, I love to tell my perimenopausal and postmenopausal uh, patients that even if they've never lifted a weight in their life, I really want them to start doing some strength training. Now is the time to really start walking up and down those stairs and I want them to be sitting on the floor and getting up and down because I just want them to maintain all those strength muscles. What else do you get your patients to do? Yeah, so yeah, I would always say hormones with other things. And and also some people don't want to take hormones. You know, that fear is very much ingrained in them. And for some people, it, it can it is still considered contraindicated, although that's still, I think, a personal decision. So the other things that are key for me would be looking at your nutrition and it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just eat real food. You know, even if you start there, that's a good start. If your diet's already pretty good, then I think it's really important that you do get adequate protein in your diet. I think a lot of women don't tend to eat much protein and that is so important for building your muscles. So and it can be harder if you're on a plant-based diet. It is easier if you do eat meat and fish. By eating plenty of protein and a huge rainbow range of vegetables and some fruit because you're getting all of these wonderful chemicals that you just can't get out of supplements um, or and you certainly can't get out of processed foods that decrease this inflammatory process of aging and actually probably help you metabolize your hormones and perhaps even create some more hormones of your own. So building muscle, eating more protein, you're probably going to start producing a little bit more testosterone yourself, for instance. Um, so nutrition and definitely weight training, because if you're mobile, you'll see your friends, you'll see your children, you'll see your grandchildren, and that moving and that building muscle is so important. The other things that I think are really underused would be breathing. And I know you've interviewed the wonderful Rosalba already. And so really looking at breathing both to improve well-being and decrease that fight or flight response, but also to potentially reduce snoring and mouth breathing overnight. So I think breathing is really underused. And my patients always laugh when I say, do you do breathing? And they're like, well, yes, and I'm, but do you breathe well? And, you know, I can see them all thinking I'm a bit mad at that point. But I do think breath work is so integral to good health. And 
I think there's room for a bit of meditation. I'm not a great meditator, so I sort of, I'm always trying to find things that are bite size and doable for people. So I think even if you can do your breath work, you'll probably get some meditation value out of that. And the other thing is social connection. So really important to see people that make you feel good about yourself because that releases oxytocin. And oxytocin is the grand dam of all of our hormones. So when oxytocin is there, it really can reduce the cortisol and make you feel well and snuggly and loved. So having hugs and seeing people and being connected, I think, is is so critical for well-being. And we know that from the Blue Zone studies. These are people that live over 100, tend to be well-connected socially. Yeah, absolutely. Kerry, obviously you and I could talk all day and we frequently do. Um, I would love just to finish to talk about one last topic, and that is one of the big topics that comes up with patients is this change in body shape. So weight gain and suddenly feeling like their trousers don't fit anymore. Everything feels tight. They don't seem to have just quite got that waist that they used to ha- have. What's going on there? So I think there's there's different processes probably going uh, on at that point. If, when your ovarian estrogen, your estradiol starts to decrease, one of the theories is that your body's desperately trying to make some estrogen from somewhere. And the only place it can really do that is in your fat cells. So it can make estrone, which is a more inflammatory estrogen from your fat cells, from a something that's made in your adrenal gland. So that's one thing. The other thing is that that reducing level of estradiol means that you become a bit insulin resistant. So you're just not as metabolically efficient. So your insulin levels go up. And when your insulin levels go up, you tend to put down more fat cells. And the third thing, there's probably many more, but the third thing I think is quite critical is that we know when people are transitioning through their menopause years, they lose a lot of their diversity of their gut microbiome and that probably really impacts how you metabolize food so we know that just having a diverse microbiome really aids people to have a healthier body weight and I would always say to people when they're worrying about their shape you know they're always like well I eat less and I'm like please don't eat less just think about eating more good stuff and think about moving more and just trying to introduce really small bits of movement in your day because we know the more muscle you have the more testosterone you'll have, the more insulin sensitive you will be and the better food you eat, the better your gut microbiome will be. And those are things that you can control. So I think um, that body shape thing is a really difficult thing, especially for women to to live with. But it's, I think, really focusing on building muscle and eating more, so much more than the old kind of rhetoric of dieting where you lose fat but you also lose muscle and you know running which and doing all this high intensity stuff which just drives your cortisol up which isn't good for you at all so keeping it calm being kind to yourself and you know and setting some realistic goals absolutely and surely as well if you're losing muscle because we know that we lose muscle mass as well then surely we've got a change in basal metabolic rate as well so yeah, there's lots going on there. It's just a, a, it's definitely one that comes up a lot to me in the consulting room. People are are really upset about it, and they feel quite self conscious. They're saying, "I'm not eating anything differently. I used to be able to. I know what I used to be able to do to control my weight, and I just don't seem to be able to anymore." Um, anecdotally, do you feel like when you put people on hormones that that improves at all, or that you see weight stabilizing? Yeah, absolutely. It can be slower for some than others. So if you're in perimenopause, it can be much easier to sort of get that balance again. If you've had a few years where you've not had hormones, it certainly can be slower because you're undoing quite a long period of time. But we know with bone density, for instance, that we'll see women building bone on hormone therapy. So, and we see their cholesterol markers going down, but the weight can be a bit slower to follow suit. So, you unfortunately, you do have to work hard, and hormone therapy is not going to make you lose weight on its own absolutely have to do the weight training you have to increase the heaviness of your weights and I suppose even if you take it further it's not just about looking good but it really is so powerful in terms of um, building your bone density building your muscle future proofing your body for the next 10 20 30 years and I think that's a message that we really need to get out to younger women you know 
don't wait until you're 50 or you're 45, you know, look at your diet and your exercise in your 30s. It's, as we all know, it's much harder to lose weight, lose, you know, lose a change in body shape than it is to gain it. So really trying to look early in our life that we move women into more strength training and away from these kind of high intensity cardio workouts and really looking at our diets in a more healthy way. Um, I think it's yeah, something we, we as GPs should really be advising people on way before, you know, the damage has sort of or at least taken hold. Yeah, I think it's really interesting as well when people start to do strength training. I just see people's confidence go up. Don't really know why, but they just feel really proud of themselves watching their their progress. And, and they remember that, you know, initially that two kilos was really hard for them. And now they're, you know, lifting much heavier weight and they just feel really strong and, and just have a slight invincibility about them that they'd lost before, which is so nice to see. Yeah, no, I love that. I've got some ladies in their late 70s, you know, who are on a combination of treatment and they're just lifting heavier and heavier weights. And I think we're really ageist as a society. And I, the, the things that I see my older women doing are, is just phenomenal. You know, they're, they are quite inspirational. Amazing. Kerry, it has been fantastic talking to you. I know that we are going to do this again because you've got so much knowledge to share. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything that you would like to say to our audience or anything that we haven't talked about that you would just like to, to give a message to anyone listening? I think we've covered most of the, the main points, but I do think that women should be confident in what they think is going on themselves. So if they think it's their hormones, it probably is. And if your doctor doesn't listen the first time, try again or try a different doctor. And I think one of, one of my exciting things that I, my revelation recently was if you don't think somebody's going to listen to you, bring a friend. Because as a doctor, it's really scary when somebody comes in with a friend and you have somebody sitting there advocating for you when you may not be able to advocate for yourself. So bring a friend or bring a partner, you know, bring, 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 you know, sort of, you know, a bit of extra help. And really, you know, if you do have to fight a bit, which unfortunately women often do, but as a doctor, it is really quite scary when somebody comes in with a friend. Don't be giving away all our tricks and tips. And so the question I ask everyone who comes on the podcast is, what would they love to go back and tell their 20-something selves? That's a hard thing. There's so many things that I would love to tell my 20-year-old self, but I, knowing me now and knowing me then, I wouldn't listen. Um, so I think I probably can't change anything because it's all, it's, it's all led to here. But certainly as a doctor, I keep having dreams about going back to medical school. So I, part of me would be like, can you go and listen and can you really ask them more about women's health and don't just accept what you're told to be the truth? And I do think our new generation of doctors coming through are better at asking why. And I, I do feel I missed opportunities to maybe just ask why a bit more. Because in a way, professionally, I feel a bit like I've been in the matrix for 20 years and I've only just woken up. So I think that would be the one thing I might. And maybe I would have listened to that. I don't think I would listen to any of the other wisdom I would like to share with my younger self. Unfortunately, there would be a lot of things I would say, but you can't change the past. Absolutely. Kerry, thank you so much. If anyone wants to get in touch with you, how can they find you? So, um, yes, I have an Instagram account, imaginatively named Dr. Kerry Cashel. And I'm also on LinkedIn where I post a bit more professional stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I am unable to take on any new patients, but Sean and I are working on trying to improve access for patients to better hormonal care. So more information to come. I think you'll agree we've had some incredible guests on the podcast already and today's was no exception. I think there is so many nuggets of information I'd love to get out there. So if you know someone who would benefit from the podcast, please share it. That way more people can learn all about themselves. Remember, this podcast is all about you. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare or other professional advice. Information is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. If you have any health concerns, always consult your doctor. 